Thank you. So, um, you know, I just got to start off by saying I really feel doubly blessed today. First, we're in just a magnificent place all together here. And I wanted to, you know, thank you again, Heather and Matthew, for uh, organizing this whole thing and inviting me here. Um, but also I get to introduce you to something that is, is fun. So I am not going to help you optimize your productivity. I'm not going to uh, help you save money or time or you know, improve your relationships. But I am going to show you something that is entertaining. It can exercise the mind. And you know, it's, just, it's just fun. And fun is a worthwhile goal in and of itself. Okay? This is interactive fiction. And <laughs> what interactive fiction is, well, actually, before we even get there, let's do goals. Uh, because we've got a short time. And I think in terms of what we can meaningfully hope to achieve today, we can learn the basics of what this all is. I can teach you how to get it. Most interactive fiction out there these days, it's free. You can just download it. Uh, doesn't cost you anything, and it runs on pretty much any hardware. You don't need to buy anything special. And I can teach you how to play it. There are basic rules involved, some conventions. Not hard. You know, five minutes, you'll, you'll be there. I'll also mention just the basics about how to write it. Um, that is its own talk in and of itself beyond this. It's more advanced, but I'll give you the pointers to get along the way there. and. Uh, I'll be, you know, we're all on the ship together here. Uh, feel free to just grab me any time, and I'll, I'll introduce anyone who's got the interest. Whoop. I'm doing the wrong screen again. Okay. Now, what is interactive fiction? Now, the obvious answer that you might just come up with if you were being sarcastic is, well, it's fiction that's interactive. <laughs> and while I appreciate answers like that, uh, in this case, it isn't even strictly correct because it's a broad enough topic now that if you really go across all the boards, you're going to find strange examples here and there that really don't qualify as fiction. So it's not really an accurate answer. The interactive part is true, but the fiction part mostly true. What it really is, is it's computer-based literature. And I don't know if there are any literature geeks out here. OK, cool. If you think about new forms of literature, you know, new forms of literature, you know, what do we have? We've got things like the modern short story. You know, the modern short story goes back to the, about the 1700s, give or take, would you say? Um, things like the novel and novella, they go back probably to the 1300s, and those are the new ones. Interactive fiction is a type of literature that is developing now, right in our lifetimes. And the reason it's developing now is because it really requires a computer to recognize its full potential. It's literature that it's not just the author that writes something static and leaves it. It's literature that the reader interacts with and not really co-creates, but definitely has influence over the outcome. So each reader going into a piece, well, it's true to some extent with every piece of literature. Every reader gets something different out of it. It's much more true with interactive fiction. Interactive fiction is a branching narrative. Where you go, what you do in the story, will change. You can even read the same piece twice and get two different things out of it, go along two different paths. And it's also a game and a story. And its roots are in games. And even today, you will find that different interactive fiction pieces can be more game-like, can be more literary. It's really a, you know, a question of what the author was trying to get out of the story. And if you're really interested in the literary side, there are, there are scholarly works out there doing analysis of interactive fiction as a literature. Uh, Twisty Little Passages by Nick Montfort would be one. But it's something where I encourage you to try to experience it on your own before you just start reading dry materials like that. 
Uh, and I'm not discouraging you from doing that. And I'm not trying to cast any aspersions on those materials. They're, they're scholarly. They're, they're really thorough, but it's not necessarily the best introduction. So the early origins of interactive fiction. There are a lot of things out there that are kind of precursors. Dating back even as far as the 1960s, we have things like Eliza that people will sometimes throw out there as being, oh, that's early interactive fiction. I wouldn't say Eliza's early interactive fiction. I'd say Eliza's really the grandmother of all chatbots. Um, there are other things out there too, like Hump the Wumpus and D&D, &D, and that's actually D, you know, and D, the letters. Um, which were more game-like, they were text-based games, but I wouldn't really call them interactive fiction either, although some people will herald them. Um, the place I think we should probably start the story is with William Crowther. And he was someone who, as he worked with computers as a, for a living, but as a hobby, he liked caving. Uh, and he would go spelunking in the Mammoth Caves in Kentucky, and he spent a lot of time there, and he spent a lot of time there with his wife, and they had two daughters, and then ultimately they got divorced, and she left with the kids, and he kept on there, spelunking, and he was lonely. He missed his kids, and he wanted to find some way to connect with them, and what he did, out of the very human way of just trying to connect with his kids, he ended up writing he ended up writing something that he thought would be able to help share his experience of caving and in a way that wasn't just the, you know, the dry sort of way of, uh, you know, I saw this cave today, but rather would share it also in its exploration and its discovery. He wrote about the different pieces and he linked them together in such a way that his children would be able to work their way through in much the way that he would. And so they wouldn't know what was around the corner and they wouldn't know what was around you know, this patch or this patch and they could pick whichever way they wanted to go and it would unfold as it would for him. And keep in mind, he, this was all back in around 1975. And so computer graphics didn't really exist then, it was text. So it was all his description. And his descriptions, even as they read today, are, are, are fairly evocative of the real place. Um, there's a certain realism in it that you can feel. And all that being said, it's also a little bit dry. And so if you're not someone who's really interested in that caving, and you're not someone who's personally tied to it, you might get a little bit bored with it after a while. And <coughs> in spite of this, he shared it with the world across, there wasn't an internet back then, there was the precursor of it, the ARPANET, and also the sneaker net, people sent out tapes and we'll go from his story to the other side of the country over in Stanford. A fellow named Don Woods, who was a player of Dungeons and Dragons, and I know a few of you in the audience know about Dungeons and Dragons. Um, he got this and he liked the idea of it, but he wanted to spice it up. And so he started adding fantasy elements to it. He added puzzles to it. He started to try to make it more game-like. And this is the point, I think, that we really get the first of what I would call interactive fiction. It's something where you have, uh, on the one hand, this blend of you know, realism and experience, and on the other hand, more fictional elements, the, uh, you know, the, the part to try to draw the reader in and to hook the reader and to keep the reader involved and engaged. And it's these two things together, this merge, that really makes it. And Don Woods over in Stanford, you know, he worked on this piece, and he released his stuff out on ARPANET, and it made its way back to MIT. And actually, one of the people that he played D&D with made his way back to MIT, too. And a group of folks over at MIT, and that picture I showed earlier, the, the, the funny-looking one, that's... It, that's at MIT, and that's actually right in the area where some of these folks worked. That, the people at MIT, they went on and they started making their own thing. They started building their own game, which became known as Zork, which a lot of people have heard of. 
And at first it only ran on the MIT mainframe. Uh, that's what they had. They went on though and uh, you know, they ultimately turned that into a company. But we'll get there in one second. They don't do that right away. Before they get there, other people beat them to the punch. And uh, these pictures here are actually some of the earliest commercial releases. Um, I don't know if anyone's ever heard of Scott Adams, not the Dilbert Scott Adams, but the Scott Adams Game Maker. <coughs> First ever commercial release of interactive fiction, 1978. And it's the one there with that dragon. <laughs> A lot of these other ones are Scott Adams too. And this isn't all of the games that were released in this time period. Uh, but it is a good representative number of them. And you'll see that Adventureland, that's actually a, that's a version of what you know, Will Crowther and, and Don Woods had put together. Um, modified and ultimately commercialized, although not by them. So neither of them really ever made any money off of it, even though they invented it. Important to note, too, that that cave influence, the whole idea of crawling around in caves, that sticks with interactive fiction for an awful long time. <laughs> yes. And so even things that you would think would have no excuse to have a cave or any kind of uh, uh, passages or areas to crawl around in, you'll find caves. <laughs> <laughs> These early games also, they don't necessarily play that well for a, uh, for a modern player. That, the actual technical interface is, is fairly limited. Most of them have two word commands only. And it's a little bit limiting when you, when you start to play with them. So if you really get into interactive fiction, some of these are worth revisiting, but I wouldn't necessarily recommend you start here. <laughs> so the next phase is where it goes commercial. And if you want to try to divide these phases up that I have, you could say that the that first early origins in around the 70s, 75 is when Adventure came out, 78 is when the first commercial release came out. This we're looking at more of the 80s. And there's not a hard and fast line and by any stretch, but it's easy to think of it that way. A lot of titles came out during this time period, lots. And this is only a tiny, tiny smidgen of them. And the ones I'm showing here, you know, of course the Zorks, there was a whole series, not just one. Um, the original MIT game that those folks worked on, they broke it into three, so it would be able to, each part would be able to fit on the home computers of the time. And they formed their own company called Infocom out of Cambridge, Massachusetts. And that was you know, the most successful of all of the interactive fiction companies. It, it grew quite large. Uh, ultimately, it was sold in 1986. Uh, Activision ho holds its rights now, and so you can still buy some of these commercial titles from Activision. Um, they developed the Z Machine, which is a virtual machine for actually writing this, you know, that writing this stuff as a target for. Uh, what it meant is that the authors could focus more on the stories rather than having to program everything. And so it was a really early example of virtual machines in use in the industry. Um, it, it's, you know, and considering that the time period in the 80s, I don't know how much, you know, some of you probably don't remember the 80s, some of you probably do, but in the 80s, there were lots of little different incompatible computers. Lots of them, a whole array of them. And Infocom, ported that virtual machine to each of these computers once. And then they took their data files and they moved them to each version with the vir virtual machine. And they were able to sell the same title to you know, all the different platforms. So it was uh, the whole idea of the virtual machine arose out of that, uh, that myriad of different platforms that existed in the 80s. But Infocorm was hardly alone. There was magnetic scrolls. There was Trillium, later called Tellurium, and you'll see some of the titles in there, um, uh, quite a few. This time period was also, you know, the height of the commercial success. A lot of, you know, well-known conventional authors got involved in the game, and uh, anyone here of Douglas Adams? Uh -huh. 
you'll see a few in here by him. Um, he got involved, uh, he published no fewer than three that he worked with directly, with two of them through Infocom, one on his own. He started his own company. And others as well. The, uh, uh, another example, Michael Crichton was involved with one. There was the strong belief that this was the future. You know, the 80s saw interactive fiction. This is the future of games. You know, the, the pinnacle of games, in some extent, in terms of the, the actual experience, the actual storytelling capabilities. This looked like it. Um, of course, if you remember the 80s, you may also remember that shortly thereafter, in, in around the 90s is when computer graphics really took off. And so uh, it went from being believed to be the future to uh, people believed it was just going to go away. You know, and obviously, you know, once movies were invented, books went away, right? <laughs> so it moved to the next phase. And in the 90s, interactive fiction as a commercial thing it was gone. However, in around 1987, people reverse engineered the Z machine. And that meant they were able to write their own versions of it for newer platforms. That meant once you got that, you could you know, take those old titles and move the data over, and you could run it on new stuff again. People started creating tools to write interactive fiction. So in around 95, we had the development of uh, Frots, and around 97 we had the development of TADS, around 93 Inform, and all these different tools allowed you to do different things, to both write and read and play, and people started making their own new stuff. This right here is only a tiny, tiny sample of what's been made since interactive fiction died. Um, by far, the most, you know, the titles that are out there, percentage-wise, are in this period when interactive fiction was theoretically already dead. And a lot of these now are considered classics. It's kind of glancing through just out a few. Um, you know, there's Galatea, Hadean Lands, Anchorhead, Warbler's Nest. And just as back in the 80s where you know, this was coming to fruition, there were all different kinds of computers and platforms. There were all different kinds of, well, formats for this. You know, Infocom wasn't the only one writing interactive fiction, and other groups did their own things. And so you'll find Z Code, GLULX, TADS, Hugo, Adrift, Twine, Inc., etc. But I realize that I, I still haven't actually told you what it is. Um, I, I gave you, you know, the answer of, well, what is a penguin? Well, a penguin is an animal. And, and that's the kind of answer I gave you here. And that's not really satisfactory. So to better express what this is, I think it makes more sense to try to take a look at an actual real title. And I've picked Lost Pig. This is one from that latter stage, so it's modern, it has a modern interface, and it's one that's often used to introduce people to interactive fiction. Okay. So, first off, don't worry about reading this, okay? I'll, I'll read you the relevant parts in a minute. What I want you to try to look at first is just the kind of layout, because this is going to be pretty typical of you know, parser-based interactive fiction. So you've got a section up here, that's the introduction. It's a variable length piece, it's up to the author, it can be a few lines, it can be a few pages, whatever. It tries to introduce the story. You've got your title, metadata type stuff, it tells how it was made, what version it is, because it's both software and literature, it's got a version. <laughs> Bugs can be, exist and be fixed. It tells what it was made with. It tells what actual underlying format it uses. You know, for help, use help. It may have advice in there like that. And then it gives you the first part of the setting. It gives you a name for the setting, and it gives you a description. It also has a status bar where it tells you, you know, where you're physically located at the time, and 
Some of these, if they're more game-like, they have a score. Not all of them do. Now, something I got to point out here. I'm, let me do this. Okay. Uh, this actually is interactive. So this is the real thing. You're looking at something that actually works and runs. And it kind of shows how portable all this interactive fiction stuff is that here we are at the end of the world. We don't have anything resembling an internet connection. And yet we can still run something like this in a presentation live. And we will do that in a minute. But I first want to just show you one thing fast. This right here ah, is a reference card. As a, that's a good intro to, to using parser-based interactive fiction. It's downloadable, and I can hook people up with copies if they want to. It's made by one of the, one of the user community. And there is a very active interactive fiction user community out there now. Basically gives you a whole bunch of suggestions, you know, suggested things to do. So you can, you can type directions, just abbreviate them to move around. You can L for look, you can abbreviate it to L. Um, or uh, examine, you can abbreviate to X. If you want to look at something up close, inventory, see what you're carrying, you can abbreviate to I. But beyond that, you can really just type any old verb you want and try to command the character in it. And interactive fiction is just like any other fiction. You can have any genre you want. You can have any kind of characters you want. Any kind of the tricks you can put into regular writing, you can put into this. So if we go back to the sample we were looking at, And it looks like I lost my screen here. What? Maximize it. There we go. Hmm. It's like maximized too much. Is there a. It just doesn't have the left but it's like TV. Okay. Well, I'll read it for you anyway. So, again, this is Lost Pig. So, in Lost Pig, you're taking on, you know, the. You're playing the role of the protagonist, who is an orc. Okay? And that's relayed to you in just actually a few lines of, of pretty distinctive language. So. You know, what we got here is, uh, you know, the orc and, you know, Pig lost. Boss say the grunk fault. Say grunk forget about closing gate. Maybe boss right. Grunk not remember forgetting. But maybe grunk just forgot. Boss say grunk go find pig, bring it back. Him say if grunk not bring back pig, not bring back grunk either. Grunk like working at pig farm, so now grunk need find pig. So in a few lines, it tells you right away you know, the, the essence of the story, the conflict, you know, so it's classic, you know, man versus nature, as you can see, or in this case, orc versus pig. And, you know, you've got the, the problem where this pig is gone, and you've got to try to locate the pig. You've got to try to bring it back, capture it, bring it back. And as you may guess, that's not going to necessarily be all that simple and straightforward. Um, and if you don't successfully bring the pig back, you lose your job at the pig farm, and you know you like working at the pig farm. You know who wouldn't? <laughs> so, tells us our now situation. So right now we're outside. Grunk think that pig probably go this way. It hard to tell at night time, because moon not bright as sun. Their forest to east and north. It even darker there, and Grunk hear lots of strange animal. West of Grunk, their big field with little stone wall. Farm back to south. So it's telling you where you can go. You can go you know, west, or west you can see the big stone wall. Farm itself is back to the south. So we could just type south. But you know, that won't do it. You know, grunk get in big trouble if grunk go back without pig. So you don't want to go south. Um, at this point, what we'll do is you give suggestions, and I'll, I'll put them in. So what would you like to do? East? Forest look dark. Pig probably someplace in there. But Grunk not know which way to go. Not want to end up in forest with no pig. Well, maybe you go to the field. OK. 
Okay. West. Grunk not allowed in field. That probably okay, because Grunk not think pig tall enough to climb over wall. Forest look dark. Pig probably someplace in there, but Grunk not know which way to go. Not want to end up in forest with no pig. Okay. Wall made of many big rock. It not very tall. Grunk lots taller than wall. Maybe it too hard find enough big rock to make big wall. Their field on other side of wall. Grunk just see ground. Grunk hear noise. It come from some place in bushes, but Grunk not sure which way it come from. Favorite bushes? Many tree and bush and leaf and branch and other plant like that. That what forests mean. It dark too. <laughs> Pig probably someplace in there, but Grunk not know which way to go. Can we wait for the daylight? We can wait. <laughs> okay, Grunk good at waiting. Oink, try say oink. <laughs> say oink. <laughs> Nobody answer grunk. <laughs> examine what? Well, what would you say to examine a noise? Listen. Listen. Grunk, get quiet. Listen for noise in dark. There, hear noise again. It come from northeast. Must be pig hiding in bushes. And. <laughs> okay. And so some stories will actually use a score as a way of telling you that you're going along the right direction, the intended plot. Um, that isn't always the case, and a lot more modern stories actually don't do that. They don't give you any kind of guidelines because they don't really believe in them. But uh, some stories do. And in this case here, it is, there's a definite good outcome, and yeah. it's helping you along the way. So go go northeast. Northeast. <laughs> uh, that where pig go, that where grunk go. It's hard to see where grunk going to because there's so much dark and leaves and branches there. Then suddenly, they're not ground here anymore. Oof, ow, oof, oof. Grunk fall down deep hole. Drop torch. Torch go out when Grunk land on it. So now it dark too. Hole. Grunk at bottom of deep dark hole. It even smell like deep dark hole. There's some light that come from tunnel to east. But how Grunk see where Grunk at? Look like there may be <coughs> stairs at west side of hole that go up to outside. But them all broken now. There big crack in ground near stairs too. Grunk see torch. Black and sooty here. Get torch. Get torch. torch. Okay, got it. Light, light torch. Need fire for burning. Grunk not have fire. Okay. Now, at, at this point, <laughs> at this point, I gotta kind of break us off. Uh, this is meant to be more just an intro of the what it is. Uh, to train up, to sell you on it, to show you why it's it's worthwhile. <laughs> so I really do invite you to you know, explore this on your own. Um, I want to just run you through though, uh, really fast, how you find stories, how you get them, how you play them, and, and this is pretty quick, really. Um, for finding stories, like this picture is from something called the IF Archive that they set up in '92. And it's really just still the biggest collection of, of interactive fiction anywhere. And you'll see references to something called BAFS Guide. That's not online anymore. But there is an IF wiki. And th there is something called the IFDB, which if you've ever seen the Internet Movie Database, the IFDB is kind of like that, but for interactive fiction. And there are also a bunch of contests. I'll, I'll just run them through and just real fast. There's the interactive fiction competition you know, the interactive, it's the first. Uh, it was started in 1995, 
and every year it produces a whole bunch more interactive fiction. And anyone who wants can just read it and judge it. There's also the XYZZY Awards. They were started in 96. Uh, the Saga Senate Ghost Story, I started that in 98. Uh, Intro Comp, 2002. If you do get interested in writing, that's a good one because you get to just write a little bit. You don't have to write a full thing. And with that little bit, you can get feedback from other authors and readers, and they'll let you know what they think of it, what, you know, give you advice. Uh, and Spring Thing started in 2002. There's a bunch of others. That's just a really cursor review. But the easiest way to find interactive fiction is to go to the IFDB. And we're a little bit cut off here. But it's, I'll, and I'll put the link up there later and I'll share it around. But it's really the easiest way to find titles to play. You, you can just, there's a search bar up here. You know, enter your interest in the search bar or browse by category. And then you can kind of cruise your way down. Um, you'll see that, uh, you know, say you're looking for something like Anchorhead. You can click into Anchorhead. And why is this all? It's even cut more than I think than it was before. But you'll see that it gives you a description about the story. It gives you a way to play online, a way to download it, all free. You'll see something referred to a cruelty scale in there. <laughs> and the cruelty scale is, what that's about, it's not about the, uh, what you'll find in the game, but it's about how the game plays. So something that is, is on the more merciful side of the cruelty scale is not going to let you lose your progress easily. It makes it so that it's uh, more forgiving about your mistakes. Something that's on the crueler side of the cruelty scale is the kind of thing where you really have to save often and keep multiple different saves because you may um, have lost the game and not realize that you've lost it. But once you get all the way down, you can just click right in and you'll be there. And so this is what Anchorhead looks like. It starts off as a different thing than, than Lost Pig. It, it's a very different kind of story. This one here is horror. Now, how to play them? Well, like I said, you know, people reverse engineered the Z machine in various other formats back in the you know, late 80s, early 90s. You can play it on pretty much anything these days. If you've got a Chromebook, just click that Play Online button. Find it through IFDB and, and just click it. You're, you've got it. If you've got a desktop or a laptop, you know, Mac OS, Linux, MS Win, doesn't matter. You can't go wrong with Lectrode. Lectrode is um, it's an application that will just play those downloaded files. If you've got iOS, iPhone, iPad, whatever, frauds through the Apple Store. And that actually comes with Lost Pig and Anchorhead and a bunch of other stories just to start with. I'm most familiar with Android, but the Google Play Store has several different apps that will let you play them. Anyone you recommend? Uh, like I said, I'm not really familiar with Android. I don't use it, so I'm the wrong one to ask. Um, so at this point, you're probably kind of at the mercy of the stars. <laughs> those stars, not like those stars. But, uh, you know, I would imagine that any of them can. It's, it's a solved problem at this point in time. So. And beyond this, you know, I really just want to try to you know, finish up with just saying what I didn't say. And that's that we only touched on just a tiny bit. The one example I gave was a Passer interactive fiction, which was the earlier kind. There's also choice-based, which if you've ever played a choose your own adventure story, it's more like that. There you go. Um, the choice-based ones are more like choose your own adventure stories, but they, being on a computer, they can still track state and things in a way that a book can't. Um, and the tools actually used for those things have been turned around and used in other ways. So I don't know if anyone has seen the Netflix uh, you know, interactive movie Bandersnatch. That was actually built with the public, you know, the, the open source tools that are used to build interactive fiction. That's, that's how they designed it. The uh, particular tool they use is called Twine, 
which was designed to, to build choice-based interactive fiction. Um, there's a few insider things that I'll just kind of mention to you quickly so you'll know about them. Um, you'll find references to funny terms like XYZZY and Plug and Plover. Um, these are just different terms from earlier games. Um, and, and in fact, a lot of them come from Adventure, where they didn't have the idea of saving it built in, but they had these, this notion of different uh, restore points, where if you entered one of these magic words, you could get back to a point where you were. Um, the command think is one that a lot of games have built into it, even though it's one that you may never think about. Um, and a lot of times you can use it, or the author who makes the, you know, the story, can use it as a way to just help you recollect where you are and what you've already done and what goals you may still have to achieve. Um, Grues are a monster that are all throughout interactive fiction. Um, there is still some debate as to where they originate from, uh, whether they are actually an interactive fiction original or whether they're, you know, they predate it. Um, it's hard to say. Um, of course, the term gruesome is... Uh, it's just an old English term, and so um, it's an obvious word, so it's, it's difficult to tell. Um, but Gru's live in the dark, and some of the older games, and even some of the newer ones, uh, will, put, will populate the dark with Gru's, and so if your character moves around too long in the darkness, you will get eaten by a Gru. And the reason for that is because it's easier to program. You don't have to worry about all the different cases in the dark if you have Gru's that will you know, simply eat any player and end the game. And uh, there's another term you might see out there is Frobos, and that's another one, that's, that one's from Zork. Okay, whoop. So at this point, you should have a feel for what interactive fiction is, you know, where you can get it, and how you can play it. Uh, if you don't, you know, hit me up. And again, you don't have to do it now, you can catch me anytime, I'm off and outside. And uh, we're all on the same ship together for the next you know, week or so. And those are some of the links I promised. The IF archive, the Internet Fiction Database, uh, you know, Interactive Fiction Database, the Interactive Fiction Wiki, and the uh, Interactive Fiction Technical Foundation. And PRIF there is where you can get that reference card. And well, about me, you can find me online as well. So, any questions? That's, I think I'm a little bit over my time. Mm -hmm. <laughs>